coming in this very intensive week with seminars every day, two seminars today, so, but this is the, the best one. <laughs> Thank you, Hector, for, for coming. Well, he's an expert in very high resolution uh, polarimetry images for pro proto protoplanetary disks. He did his PhD in, at the University of Utrecht. After that, he moved to um, Valparaíso, where he's, he did, oh, he needs some water. Uh, he did some uh, work with um, M VLT and ALMA uh, images. And now he, then he moved to uh, Universidad Autónoma in Madrid to work with Eva Villaver. And now he's currently working in a SAC with uh, doing, uh, well, working with Gaia, Gaia Catalog, and he's, uh, that is the talk he, he's going to talk about now. So please go ahead. Can you hear me? It's ready. Okay. Uh, thanks, Olga, for the introduction, and thanks uh, to the seminars organizers for giving me the opportunity of, of presenting this in this kind of week that I know that you have an overdose of, of seminars. And I'm the seminar organizer also of, of seminars at this act, so I know it's difficult to pack more than two seminars in a week, so thanks, uh, I appreciate it. Um, in this talk, as uh, Olga already mentioned, I'm going to present my recent work, which is related to exploding and exploring the, the Gaia Data Release 2 catalog, searching for pre-main sequence stars and also, kind of most importantly for me, for the disks associated to some of these, uh, uh, these stars. And actually, uh, most of the things that I'm going to present, if not all the things that I'm going to present, are shown in, the, in a paper that was accepted a few months ago. It's this one, the census of uh, raw Fucus candidate members from Gaia Data Release 2. Uh, it's a work that took me like the first year of my research uh, fellowship at ISAC. And I also did a lot of it in collaboration with Carles Cantero, who was my trainee student by that time and is now starting a, a PhD. So uh, this is the, what they call the three M's, the, the skeleton of my talk, the motivation, uh, the methods and, and the main results. Uh, so motivation, why I like uh, protoplanetary disks and pre-main sequence stars, and why should I bother to, to find more? I will, I will explain, elaborate more in the next uh, slides. The methods, a bit of machine learning is something that is becoming quite popular nowadays. Uh, some of my favorite machine learnings or thinking machines over there, probably you are familiar with them as well. I will also explain a bit of, of the methodology that I'm using. And uh, one of my main conclusions is that there are hundreds, if not more, of, of pre-main sequence stars uh, hidden in the data archive waiting for us to be discovered. And I'm actually nowadays more and more into researching, researching using the, the astronomical data archives. And there is, there is many, many things that you can find down there. So, uh, let's go to the, to the beginning, to the motivation, why protoplanetary disks are interesting and, and again, why should we look for more? I'm assuming that you are not really, or some of you are not really familiar with protoplanetary disks, pre-main sequence stars or early stellar evolution. So that's what I include in this very simple sketch where I'm showing the early stages of, of a stellar evolution. Those are artistic impressions of the entire process. And those seem to be artistic, but they are not artistic impressions at all. Actually, they are real observations. So at the beginning, you know, we have a cloud that collapsed for, 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 for different re uh, reasons. And at certain points, some regions within the cloud become more dense. And uh, at a certain stage, this small piece of the cloud becomes so dense that a young protostar emerges. And <clears throat> when this happens, the system enters what we call the class one. Here, uh, there is a lot of material surrounding the protostar, and we cannot directly see through them. We know that there is a protostar, but the environment is so dense that we cannot really, it's not easy to obtain images to see what's going on. However, with ALMA, it was, uh, we were able to take an image of, of uh, one famous system, 
And yeah, it was uh, this image be, uh, was extremely famous by the time that it was published. It shows a hell of details, like dark and narrow rings. Maybe they are carved by young forming planets, maybe not. But that's not the topic of this talk. Now anyway, as the system evolves, most of the infolium material disappears for different reasons. It can be a combination of photoevaporation or accretion, or yeah, we have music uh, background. <laughs> and then, when the infolium material disappears, the system enters what we call the class two stage. And this is my favorite one because uh, at this stage, we can take direct images of the disks. And as Olga explained during my, my presentation, this is what I've been doing in the past. During my PhD and my first postdoc, I've been taking direct images of protoplanetary disks at these stages. And this is an example of it. This is a young protoplanetary disk. Uh, the star is, well, this is a cartoon, of course. This is an Alma image. And here, uh, the colors indicate the uh, emission from dust. And in this case, the protoplanetary disk has the shape of a ring. Uh, now, as the system evolves, uh, the disk disappears, and uh, eventually the system uh, reaches what we call the class three stage, where there is no disk. There are planets, and this is a very beautiful example of, of one of these systems. And in this case, this is, I think this is the only example where we can see four planets, young planets, orbiting around the star. This is pretty amazing, at least to me. Um, what I wanted to learn, and I guess many people like me want to learn, is uh, w we want to establish the connection between what's going on in the protoplanetary stage and how we reach planet modern, uh, modern no, adult uh, planetary systems. And the thing is that uh, uh, we don't really know how this happens. If we look to the statistics of uh, recent exoplanetary studies, we know that planet formation must be something kind of common in our galaxy. Many stars actually host planets, but we don't know yet how to do the connection. We don't know. These are real images of protoplanetary disks, and we don't know how to link the properties of what we observe to the properties of adult uh, planetary systems. Uh, so this is one reason why I like to study protoplanetary disks, because I want to learn how, I want to, to know how is this connection established. Now, so by now there are many beautiful images and many detailed images of protoplanetary disks, so uh, we could think, why bother to, to look for more? And the reason is that, although there are many nice images of protoplanetary disks, to my knowledge, there is today only one image where we can uh, see a young protoplanet forming inside of, of the protoplanetary disk. And in this case, it's called PDS-70. Here you can see the disk, and this is very recent. In H alpha, you can see two young accreting systems, uh, accreting planets, sorry, that are located inside of the disk. This is the only image that we have right now where we can study the connection between forming planets and its surrounding protoplanetary disk. Again, to me, this is amazing, but so far there is only one image. So perhaps a way to learn more is to find more protoplanetary disks with forming planets. Another reason why I would like to find more protoplanetary disks is because there are some trends in the literature. I would like to know if they are really true or not. For instance, there is this trend uh, that relates the disk mass versus the stellar mass, and uh, this is the stellar mass here, the disk mass, and you can see that in Taurus, on average, the mass of the disk increases with, uh, with the stellar mass. Okay, now if we repeat the same exercise for a more evolved region, this curve, or this straight line, becomes more steep. And if we do that with an older region, we find this, this more steep uh, curve. Now, all these studies are based on uh, small samples of disks. So I would like to repeat this exercise using larger and larger samples of disks, of course. Talking about large samples of disks, I should uh, present this project. This is the Odyssea project, and I should present because I'm quite involved into that. Uh, Odyssea is to date uh, the largest uh, ALMA survey devoted to study protoplanetary disk. It's led by Lucas Hiesa, one of my collaborators, and we are observing 300 disks in the Ophiuchus star forming region. 300 is because they are all the disks detected in this cloud by Spitzer, and we see disks from class 2 to class 3 stages. And uh, for instance, one of the things that we are uh, finding by studying such large samples is that uh, the continuum disk sizes is kind of smaller than what I at least was expecting. So again, this is just to emphasize that the more disks we study, the more disks that we find, the more we will learn. 
maybe it's obvious, but uh, I like to, to emphasize this point. Um, and now I'm going to, uh, after this, this brief introduction, I'm going to start with, with the methods, with uh, why I decided to use machine learning and why I decided to look for uh, more disk in a particular region. Oof, it's, uh, I don't know. I should uh, actually look at that. The resolution the, in these surveys is not the highest, uh, precisely for that, because we wanted to, to reduce the observing time. Maybe later I can, I can easily check. We, I know there, there are two observing blocks, one at, at the resolution of 0.2 or seconds for the brightest disks, and the other block at 0.6 or seconds resolution for the class 3 and fainter disks, actually. I don't really know, but I don't think there were many, many hours. Also, because they are very close in the sky, and it was easily to take advantage of that. All right. Uh, so this actually, uh, this question allows me to, to jump to this slide, because of course, since I, I am part of the Odyssey survey, I wanted to learn more about the uh, Ophiuchus cloud, and therefore I decided to start my study focusing on the, on the Ophiuchus region. And this is what you can see here. This is a color composite image of Ophiuchus in the, using the wise, three of the four wise bands. And uh, what we see over there, these, these filaments and these complex structures, is basically warm dust emission. And this is telling us that there is a star forming going on over there. Now, in the past, uh, pre-main sequence stars, and also their associated uh, protoplanetary disks, have been traditionally detected uh, using a combination of methods. Either using X-rays, because uh, young stars are very active uh, in X-rays, especially Titauri stars. Also using optical spectroscopy, uh, mainly because uh, young stars are accreting, are accreting all the material that surrounds them, and because of that, they are very bright in H-alpha, and also if you study the H-alpha line, you will see that it's very broad with uh, many complex uh, profiles. And of course, if the, if the stars are surrounded by a protoplanetary disk, which is the case in most, uh, which is uh, quite common, the disk will emit in infrared uh, uh, wavelength because uh, the dust will reprocess the stellar light and emit at this wavelength. Now, there is a problem with, uh, with that, if you want to, to expand these studies, and is that uh, these kind of studies are expensive. And just to show you that, this is the moon size on the sky, and this is the entire, again, uh, Ophiuchus cloud. So this region is, I don't know, something like this on the sky, and you cannot go to the telescope and say, hey, I would like to take a spectroscopy of all the stars in, in a region like this. They will say, go, go home, kid, right? because it's, it's very expensive. Fortunately now, uh, we can do uh, this kind of studies uh, using Gaia, and this is what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, minutes. Um, there is an example that I use all the time in, in outreach talks, but I think, I think it is useful uh, here as well. And the thing is that uh, with Gaia, what we obtain is a part of photometry, we measure the position of the stars, uh, the distance, because with Gaia we measure the parallax, which is the inverse of the distance, and we also measure the velocity of the stars. And uh, young stars, and this is the example I use for uh, non-experts, let's say, young stars are to me like families, they are like people. Uh, like a family, let's say, the young stars, they are kind of clustered together in the space, and they also move together. If you see a family walking on the street, they kind of move together. And that makes a difference if you compare it with background or foreground stars. And now as the system evolves, as the kids in the family grow and become older, then they move away from their family and they join the other people, let's say. They, they lose their memory and then you cannot track their position back anymore. So with Gaia, as we can measure the positions and the velocity of the stars, if we observe a star forming region, we will see that the stars that belong to that region are clustered. Again, they are located in a compact region in the space, and if we measure their velocities, they are clustered in a compact region in velocity, and that you will see it in, in a moment. So the first thing that I did for my study, again, since I was focused on the Ophiuchus region, 
was to construct a control sample. And to do that, the first thing you have to do is to construct something before, an initial sample. So I was uh, uh, surveying the literature. I found these uh, three canonical papers uh, where the Fucus um, members are described. Again, those are members uh, uh, that were identified either by X-ray or uh, optical spectroscopy or infrared excesses. And at the end, I end up with 100, uh, 465 bona fide and interrogandaire members. And that was what they called my initial sample. Now, having that initial sample, I cross match against Gaia. Not all the members in that sample are included in Gaia because they are either more fainter or more red, so not all, not all of them were there. And most importantly for me, some of them uh, were actually not part of Ophiuchus, and that I could learn only by looking at the Gaia images, at the Gaia data, sorry, because uh, their astrometric properties weren't actually telling me that uh, these objects uh, belong to, to Ophiuchus. So, again, crossing my initial sample with a control sample, I found 188 uh, bona fide members, and this is what I'm plotting over here. Those are bona fide members of Ophiuchus. Then, since I had Gaia, I knew the properties, the spatial properties and velocities of this sample. And then I knew what to look for. And this is what actually what I did. I went to the Gaia archive and I say, okay, I want to download all the stars observed in a region that spatially encompass, encompassed sorry, my control sample. And I want to look at the properties of this sample. And this sample that I'm looking at contains 2,300 uh, members. Excuse me. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, um, I didn't want to much. I didn't want to go too much into the details. But uh, one thing that you have to do if you want to trust the Gaia data is apply some quality filters. And of course, one of the things that I did was apply these filters here. Uh, for instance, all the targets that I analyzed had a signal to noise in parallax larger than ten. This is kind of the canonical value that we use nowadays to convert that into distance. Also, there is another uh, property of Gaia measurements is the number of visibilities uh, is called. It's the number of times that the Gaia has observed on a star. So I apply also quality filters over there. And then there is another flag that the Gaia team developed during the last year. It's called RUBE. I don't know if I properly pronounced. I also applied that quality, quality cut over there. So I applied different quality cuts so I could trust the sample that I downloaded. Um, if you are asking me about the size, this is three and a half radius from the center of the control sample. And I didn't uh, apply any cuts in velocity space. I apply cuts on the spatial space. Okay. And this is how the sample looks in velocity. This is proper motions in the projected proper. Uh, no, this is proper motions, projected velocities in declination and rate ascension. Uh, Gaia offers radial velocity measurements for many stars, but not for all the stars in the catalog. And actually, for the sample I'm studying. Only 10% or even less, if I'm not wrong, of the stars had radial velocities. So I ignore radial velocities for, for this thing. And this is how the thing looks like. This is, of course, this is also a zoom in the velocity space because the velocities are actually much larger in both, in both directions. But I wanted to focus on the distribution of velocities of my control sample, what is leveled here as cluster one. And you can see that there is another cluster here. And no worries, I, I will go uh, into that in the next slides. So, so, one obvious question. How do you define boundaries in this region? How do you say, okay, I want only the stars that are uh, belonging to this part of the velocity space. It's not easy to discriminate between these regions, between the, by eye, at least, let's say. And also to, to, to put some light into that, I should also mention that the situation is actually uh, way more complex. Star forming regions are very complex, and Ophiuchus is not an exception. Actually, Ophiuchus sits in the middle of the upper SCO uh, region, which actually also is part of the entire SCO same, uh, uh, it's not a star forming region, uh, OB association, if I'm not wrong. This region is huge. If you remember that the full moon was kind of here, you can imagine how large is this region on the sky. And no wonder that we will have contamination of the stars that belong to Aperesco into Ophiuchus. 
So those are things that uh, we must take into account in our analysis. And also, this is something that I think affects any star forming region, actually. For instance, if you want to study lupus or chameleon, if I'm not wrong, it's also somewhere over there, you will have contamination from, from other stars. So, <clears throat> again, how do uh, I discriminate between the stars that belong to Ophiuchus and foreground background stars or stars that belong to, to upper score? Uh, uh, for my study, again, I'm focusing on the spatial distribution and velocities of my sample. And the spatial distribution has uh, three dimensions, X, Y, and Z in the galactic coordinates. And the proper motion, since I don't have radial velocities I on the project, I just use the two proper motions. So I'm going to work in five dimensions. And what you can see over there is the distribution of the Gaia sample of the 2,300 stars across each one of the dimensions. Mm. So there is the kind of classical way, let's say. I could use the boundaries uh, defined by my control sample to say, OK, I know that the focus in principle should go from here to here, in I, in Z, and, and in the other things. And then I could apply these boundaries and extract the population and, and look at the properties of that population. But nowadays, there are many tools available on the market that can do that for us in a much smarter way. And this is what I'm going to jump into machine learning. And this is what I decided. Actually, I was not really a friend of machine learning, but Carlos Cantero, the, the trainee student that started the project with me, he was uh, a real fan of that. And then uh, we learned a lot from him, I have to say. Before I focus a bit more into machine learning, let me introduce it a bit, because nowadays, again, this, this term is widely used. And machine learning is everywhere. What I used is actually maybe the easiest branch of machine learning, if, if you allow me to say that. There are basically two main branches of it, what we call the supervised machine learning and then supervised machine learning. The supervised one encompass neural networks, random forest, uh, all kinds of uh, complex algorithms over there. And you can do many kinds of things with them. One example is, for instance, this uh, human face recognition, uh, finding complex patterns, and so on. And then the, there is the unsupervised machine learning. Uh, uh, it's difficult to explain the main difference of them for me in a few minutes. Uh, the thing is that, in general, you can easily apply unsupervised machine learning to large databases. And since Gaia is a large database, this is what I did. And among the unsupervised machine learning uh, algorithms, there is the clustering algorithms, and those are the ones that I'm, I'm going to use. And again, they are very useful for data mining, finding outliers, or finding clusters. And this is my main goal, right? So yeah, uh, all the tools that I'm going to, to show you in the next uh, minutes is they belong to a supervised machine learning family of, of objects. Also, to help me to, to better explain what I mean, uh, I'm going to focus, or I focus this study in density-based uh, uh, clustering algorithms. And this is a slide that I borrowed from a very famous uh, web page, Scikit-Learn. It's a public Python package. And what you can see here is a collection of clusters, two-dimensional clusters, right? And before you get lost into all the complexity of, of this figure, let me highlight for you these two here, DBSCAN and Optics. And you can see that, in general, these two algorithms uh, perform very well in, in identifying very complex uh, uh, shapes, if you want to call them like that. It doesn't mean that these other algorithms are bad. It depends what you want to use them for, of course. If uh, you aim to, to detect complex uh, uh, clusters or clusters without clear boundaries, let's say, I would say that you better use these two, these two algorithms. And this is what I did for my study. I used uh, DBSCAN optics and hierarchical DBSCAN, and I will show you a bit more of them in the next, uh, in the next meetings, in the next uh, minutes. Also, I would like to highlight that they are also very sensitive. So you, if you inject a sample without any cluster, in principle, they, they are smart enough to say, hey, there is, there is nothing in here. There is flat. There is no cluster over there. Um, why I like these things? Um, these clustering algorithms, they help you to identify cluster compact distributions, no matter the amount of dimensions you are working on. Well, of course, you have to be careful with this amount of dimensions. If you are working on 20 dimensions, maybe you have so many degeneracies and the thing doesn't work. In my case, I applied to five dimensions. Um, <clears throat> 
these uh, algorithms don't really care about the cluster shape, and this is great because you don't know before you, open, you, exam, you, you do your analysis, you don't know the shape of the thing you are looking at. They also don't care about the underlying uh, distribution of the data because sometimes if what you're looking at has a Gaussian distribution below, okay, then maybe you can use different methods like uh, uh, Gaussian-based uh, algorithms, but you don't know in advance whether the data follows that distribution or not. And those are the three uh, small things, let's say, why I like to use them. But then, of course, uh, if you're a very conservative astronomer, and I used to be, at least I used to be in the past, uh, there are some things that I didn't like about these algorithms. For instance, they don't care about the data uncertainties. I couldn't take into account the information contained in the, into the, the uncertainties, the errors uh, associated to, to, this, uh, to these measurements. So I couldn't take into account the errors of the, of, of, of the Gaia catalog, let's say. And also there is a lot of trial and error. These algorithms are, let's say, they are not really deterministic. You have to do many trials and errors and then you learn and eventually you have an idea of what you are doing. How do they work? Again, I don't want to go really too much into the details. I don't want to bore you with, with the details of, of these algorithms. But basically, you have to teach the computer what is an overdensity. And to do so, you need to define a distance, what we call epsilon, and the amount of neighbors that surround a point on the, over in, in, in your sample. Uh, this, of course, simplifies things a lot. And of course, here I'm working in two dimensions. You have to think that, in my case, I work on five dimensions. You can extrapolate this to as much dimensions as you want. And then, of course, things become more complicated because in this example, it's very simple. By eye, you can see that there is a, what we call a core point over there. It's a point surrounded by many points. But then the algorithm starts sampling, applying this technique to every point in your, in your grid or in your sample, and then it, uh, it maps all your points in your database and it finds, it looks for, for over densities and then by merging core points, it can construct what we call a cluster. So one thing, uh, since as I just mentioned, these algorithms didn't take into account the errors of a measurement, I thought, well, maybe a, a way to fight this lack of uncertainty information is to combine three algorithms, to compare them and see what we get out of them. And this is what they did. I compare DBSCAN, it's actually, I think it's the most famous uh, density-based clustering algorithm nowadays. It's been used since before 2000s, I think, in many different fields. It actually won an award uh, on its uh, computing-related field. Then there is Optics, which is like an advanced version of DBSCAN, and then there is HDBS, hierarchical DBSCAN, which is like a combination of these two and is, uh, let's say, much more user-friendly. I ran many tests comparing, looking for, for clusters in our Gaia data, running this DBSCAN optics and hierarchical DBSCAN algorithms. Actually, I didn't mention in the, in the paper that we published, but before applying these algorithms to the real data, we did many, many tests, like creating fake clusters and injecting that in, in, in Gaia data from different sky regions, or also playing with galactic models and injecting uh, fake clusters and so on, just to learn, to have an idea of how these algorithms perform. And here in this table that we show in the paper, basically, I'm comparing uh, three relevant runs from each one of them. This is what we call minimum amount of points. This is and, and the epsilon distance, this is in the jargon of machine learning, is what is called hyperparameters. It's the parameters you give the algorithm to learn about density. And you don't have to really care about these numbers. And the important thing is the results, at least for this presentation. And in short, all these algorithms, they found a cluster, and I'm going to show that immediately, of stars that have the properties of the control sample. And in the next slide, probably it will be much clearer for you. Here I'm showing the number of elements of that cluster that this shares properties with Ophiuchus, and this is the percentage of the control sample that the algorithms found. And in general, you can see that each algorithm found something like 84% eight, of the control sample. And that's fine because the, actually uh, a real star forming region is not so clustering a space. I mean, finding 85% of, of that is already uh, a good thing. Now this slide is way more visual. Again, on the background, we can see the Fucus uh, 
image from Wise, and here in gray, what you can see is one of the, one of the uh, clusters formed by, by each one of these algorithms. And in yellow, you can see the control sample members that weren't formed by these algorithms. Now, of course, no wonder, there is, it's clear to me that why this one wasn't associated to, to the cloud by these algorithms. So at the end, what they had from these different algorithms, again, was a cluster consistent with the properties of Ophiuchus, but that also contained many, many more members. And for my subsequent analysis, I decided to be a bit conservative. I combined the outputs of the three of them, and I only worked with all the members simultaneously identified by the three of them. And that sample is what they call the control sample, contains 391 objects, uh, and I think in the next, next slides I will show. Some of them, well, uh, a large fraction of them belongs to the control sample, so bona fide members of Ophiuchus, but many of them are actually unknown until our study. And then I'm going to show you the results after the, the pain of the methodology. Mm. So, I resume. I decided to work with a common sample. Again, only the members simultaneously identified by the three algorithms. Three, nearly 400 sources, and out of it, 148 belong to the control sample that contains 188, so something, something like 85% of the control sample. And then we end up with 243 potential members. And now the other thing is that nowadays there are many tools on the data archives that you can explore more and more. So for instance, what I did, I took this sample, this subsample of members, and I cross-matched it against Simbad. And then immediately I could find the unknown objects, because they are objects that have no record in the literature, and those are objects that people is not aware yet about their existence, of course, because of Gaia probably as well. So it, this is a way to show you how easy, let's say, it is by using archive to find new objects that are probably deserve some attention. Um, <clears throat> just to show you a bit about the properties of, of this common sample, here in gray I'm showing the distribution in parallax. This is the inverse of distance of my control sample. This is the proper motion in declination, uh, sorry, in right ascension and declination. This is the common sample, and here this line shows the distribution of upper SCO based on previous studies. Of course, as I was expecting, there is some contamination of upper SCO members. By I, I would expect something like 20, 20 to 30%. This is something that I hope to, to clarify in the future with, with, different, uh, with, with new observations. Yeah, this is what you see, this small slope over here. And perhaps that is more clearly explained in this two-dimensional plot. This is, again, a zooming of the distribution of proper motions. Uh, here in the cyan, I think is the name of the color, yeah? This is the common sample, this is the control sample, and this is a presco. And actually, this is something that I know now, after publishing it and after repeating the, the study. Uh, if we would repeat our exercise using larger and larger areas in this region, it would be extremely difficult to discriminate between upper SCO and row of Ucus just by looking at the proper motions. And this is something that deserves further study. Because, of course, as you are having more and more stars that belong to SCO, it's more difficult to discriminate between the, the two stars. You are using three variables or these? Five. Five. X, Y, Z, and proper motions in right ascension and declination all the astrometric variables that they could use by now. So you are using this thing and not parallax because you are using X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah. And that's also why I applied the quality criteria before. I'm only using signal, uh, targets with signal to noise in parallax above 10 because two seconds trust the distances. And actually, well, if you go back, the thing is that the well, this is in parallax, but if you look to the distance distribution, the distance distribution, uh, the average distance to upper SCO and to row focus is just the same, 140 parsecs, 145, plus minus 10 parsecs, so yeah. nothing. It is nothing. I know a bit about the real properties of, of the thing. Uh, once I found a sample of potential new members of Ophiuchus, I could start doing some 
physics or astrophysics. This plot actually contains a lot of information. Here I, I am color coding the distances, and this is assuming in the Ophiuchus uh, region. Now, instead of showing in color the warm em emission from white, I'm showing the extinction. And you can see that the core of the region is extremely extinct. There is a lot of extinction. And this is also a way to emphasize why this type of studies, focusing on the astrometric properties to find new members, are so useful for, for, for some of the regions. If we wanted to select the members of this region by looking at the color-color diagram, color magnitude diagram, we would, we would be probably lost because the extinction is so large that we don't know really how to properly correct uh, uh, the position of the objects over there. Actually, what I'm showing here is not extinction corrected. Again, because we didn't know the extinction with Gaia, you have an idea of the effective temperature and extinction of the objects, but you have to be careful with these numbers, especially if you apply to pre-main sequence stars, because pre-main sequence stars are very complex. They are, you know, they are moving through the Hayashi tracks on the HR diagram. Many of them are surrounded by protoplanetary disks, and in this case, they are surrounded by a, a lot of extinction. So it is impossible for us, really, from the Gaia. I mean, I wouldn't trust the Gaia extinctions for this sample of, of pre-main sequence stars. So again, what I'm plotting here is the color uh, magnitude diagram in absolute uh, values, because since I had the distance, I could correct for that. And this vector here shows the average extinction in the Gaia band that I could find for a published uh, and trustable sample of pre-main sequence in this, uh, in this region, just to give you an idea of what can happen over here. However, if you look just by eye, you can see that um, the distribution of our objects is consistent with being pre-main sequence in the sense that they are not uh, in this region, which is probably populated by main sequence stars. Also, the age of, of our sample is consistent with, with published values, two to five million years. So everything is kind of consistent. I was really happy to see, to see this. And now, since at uh, the beginning of the talk, I said I'm kind of interested into the disk because that's actually my, my past formation. In the Gaia archive, they have done an, uh, an excellent job cross-matching the Gaia catalog against other uh, all sky catalogs, like the two mass and the wise infrared catalogs. And this is an SED, the spectral energy distribution of a disk that I studied. This is the Gaia photometry. Now I'm going to focus on the photometry. But this is the two mass, the infrared photometry, and this is the wise photometry. Um, and the thing is that if a star is surrounded by a disk, you will immediately see an excess. So this is kind of trivial for those familiar with, with the topic. What I did is was I, I used these cross-match tables provided in the Gaia archive. Again, I didn't do actually nothing really new or advanced. I just made use of data that is publicly available for everybody. And after applying several quality flags, I end up with a sample of 48 members from my common sample that contain nearly 400 objects. For 48 of them, I could find trustable photometry. And this is because m most of the cases, the white photometry, you have to be kind of careful with that, right? Um, and this is a color-color uh, diagram from these members, from these nearly 50 members. And this is just to illustrate the regions, uh, where, where the, uh, to illustrate what is happening across this, this diagram. So the objects that, have, that are, are located over here are probably surrounded by a class 2 disk. Um, here is the class 3 disk, and those are uh, naked photospheres. Now, again, comparing this photometry against public literature, I end up with 12 new disks. And this is what I'm showing here. So we end up with 12 disks that nobody has ever discovered before us, because they, it wasn't on the, on the literature. If you look at the numbers, it's actually, well, at, fair, at face value, it doesn't seem to be a really high number, only 12 disks. But it's 12 disks out of 48 disks. It's 25%. Eh? It's, it's, it's not low at all. So. To me, this is a really nice opportunity uh, to find new disks, and also especially for coming uh, for future infrared missions like James Webb or perhaps Spica or other missions. This is a nice opportunity to find good candidates and uh, then go to the telescopes in the next year and say, hey, I would like to observe uh, these guys. And then I'm finishing, I think I'm a bit out of uh, before time, but it's okay. So the future, 
What I would like to do, uh, confirm the membership of our candidates, and we have already started to do so by applying for telescope time. Since now we have a sample that we consider an interested sample, we are applying uh, to obtain uh, optical spectroscopy to all our new members to really find uh, uh, the stellar temperatures, the stellar, well, the stellar spectral types, and that will allow us to find the edges and confirm whether they are members or not of, of the focus region. And of course, apply this method to other star forming, forming regions. Uh, actually, regarding this point, I have no time to show that in here, but what I'm working on right now is uh, all what I've shown you uh, was made with a code in Python that they have been polishing and polishing more. And what I'm aiming to is to present this code uh, to the entire community in, a, in perhaps in an ISA linked web page where the user uh, will be able to connect, enter the coordinates of the region you want to look at in Gaia and then download the thing and then start applying clustering and so on. But uh, probably that will happen in the next, uh, if everything goes fine, <laughs> in the next month. I still have to write the paper. The code is already working, but I don't want to, to show you that uh, here because there is no time. So thanks. <laughs> We'll be ready in one month, you said? More or less? No. I months, okay. The code is ready, but uh, actually I can access it online. We have 95% of the libraries working well because there, is, there are many libraries that I've been using for that. Uh, once we have a working version, we will, I will benchmark amongst my, my colleagues, and then I have to write probably an astronomy and computing paper because it will be more uh, methodology. Methodological. So, questions? Yeah. Rafa? Wait, wait. Yeah. Uh, which tools have you used to develop the algorithms? I didn't develop the algorithms. All what I've used, uh, what I've constructed or presented is kind of, of a toolkit. I've been grabbing yeah. tools that were over there. Uh, I download or I use the DBSCAN and optics uh, algorithms that are publicly available on, on uh, scikit-learn, one of the slides that I, that I show over there. Uh, if I can reach is, yeah, oops, stop. <laughs> oh, it got a bit crazy. Uh, wait, is there on the bottom somewhere? Una más, una menos. No. Sorry. No, no. Yeah. There. Here. You can connect to this web page and you can download actually all these algorithms over there and install it. It's Python. And then hierarchical DB scan, as far as I know, is not yet implemented in this web page, in this library, but uh, you can download it. If you type hdbscan uh, Python, you will find it. For and, and I was because the, you know, uh, the type of the library, um, the type of the library that you are using, the algorithms, um, <laughs> are related with the um, amount of data data that you can process. For example, you have a very large data set. You can use this type yeah, of library. Of okay. Have, have you have you think to use other type of library like Spark? Uh, yeah, uh, the thing is that the, for, for, for this goal, I don't expect to need uh, this type of libraries you mentioned because the, well, the amount of members that we expect to find in a star forming regions with this method, uh, in Gaia, are, I don't expect to be above 1,000 members. And the samples I also looking at, as you see in this case, contain uh, 2,300 members after you apply the, the cleaning criteria. So with these numbers in mind, you don't need to use uh, Sparks. Of course, if you want to do something different, uh, yeah, use larger amount of data, we will have to change that. I think you should talk with each other later, I think. Uh, Emilio. Okay, thank you very much for this talk. In fact, you know, uh, 
particularly in this institute, uh, we have a group working on this topic, especially on this topic of looking for uh, structures in the uh, face space of the uh, Gaia, Gaia data. No? You know, and we are using also DBSCAN. DBSCAN is, has, uh, you know, another kind of library in the R package. Also, you, uh, you know the R package in statistics? Uh, in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm using also this this kind. No, it is very interesting for for many aspects. In fact, because uh, Scorpius and Taurus Lupus is a very interesting region where you know it's very close, and also you know there is many aspects in the kinematics of this region where something something strange is happening. Probably is not uh, is the only close uh, star forming region where. Uh, you know, the kinematics is completely different to any other. Have a the moving group, very difficult to explain, is it, origin by any other. And it is very interesting also that you already shown uh, a fitting of uh, some models and a stellar model at the end. Would you consider that uh, there is some kind of uh, infrared access? Not the last one, the previous one to the last one. Yeah, all right. Here. Here. This guy. Yeah, okay. This is a model. Exactly. This model is already, you know, taking also from Vosa? Uh, no, actually, uh, this is a plot that uh, the subject doesn't belong to that, but I use it because it was a really nice way to illustrate that, uh, what I wanted to do. This is, uh, well, maybe it's Bosa. It's next uh, gen. Uh, next generation. I think. Next gen. or, or, yeah. Yes. The next generation with some uh, other letters, like a BD or something like that. All right. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so that my my late question is, uh, you know, in some cases, why is also only provides the upper limit for the photometry? So, in some cases, this upper limit, you know, you can find something like a, an infrared access, but uh, you know, nothing nothing interesting is happening because the uncertainty is really very high. So, uh, do you control something like that in your? Mm, Show these 12 discs. I look by by eye. Actually, it's in, in the in the appendix of the of the paper. We show the wide band four images of all of them. Uh, I realized it wasn't. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a problem, and this is something that I would like to also investigate in the future. In many of the objects, uh, you go to the WISE archive and you look to the photometry quality flag levels, and it say AAA or AAB. And then you can download the images from the IRSA IPAC webpage, and WISE Band 4 mainly, you only see background emission. So I realized that you have to be very careful with, uh, uh, more or less I found that between 10 to 20% of, of the objects in my sample that were leveled, that appear in the WISE archive, like trustable photometry at all bands, then I was looking by eye, and again, 10 to 20 percent were actually good. They, they were contaminated by background emission. So for these 12, uh, in the paper you can see in the, in the, in the appendix, the, the wise band 4 images with also, also with it kind of, not aperture photometry, but kind of similar to identify signal to noise and say, okay, those are just some more things. Yeah, but it's a good point because there is a lot of contamination in wise. This is... Um, Comments? Yeah. Can you fit for this new disk the stellar photospheres, perhaps assuming a Kurush model, and to fit and try to characterize the stellar emission? I, I'm wondering because this, because uh, I don't know if you can say is this new disk belongs to class 0, class 1, or class 2 is spectral ties. I could do that, but probably I'm not going to do that, <laughs> because I'm now much more into, into this. However, I have to, all what I've shown is public. If you go to our paper, all the 
new objects and actually the photometry for the new disks is also public in the VCR tables. You can download it. We did the translation from magnetis to, to, to flux in whatever units that I forgot. All the members uh, from the cloud that we identified uh, in, in, the, in the archive in the VCR, we show not only the common sample, but all the members, uh, all, all the sum of, of the probable like likely members of the cloud identified by by the algorithms actually in total we found like 530 members i focus only in the common one 391 but all of them are given in the in the in the vcr you can you can do that uh, again i'm not doing that anymore because i'm focusing in, into this and yeah, i can i cannot do everything oh, but but these are the class two, class three sources, so yeah 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 Again, what I, we've done already, uh, Lucas has applied already for time uh, in many of them to see whether we can get the uh, optical spectra and then we will get uh, a better idea of the stellar properties and accretion properties. Thank you for this very nice talk and very interesting. So I have a question, very simple. So can you elaborate, uh, can you tell us exactly where is, what is the step where uh, machine learning helped you the most? In this research, the second question is, if you go to the, more or less, the growth area around the cluster, where you intuitively say the cluster is here, just looking at the SS emission with Ys in a color, color magnitude, how many disks so how many candidates would you expect that you know, include in this? How many of them? So the first is, what is the critical step that uh, machine learning has provided you? And the second is, how many are non belonging to the cluster? How many disks are there? Uh, for the first one, uh, where machine learning helped me, it was, to me, it was uh, basically here, um, yeah, here. Uh, when I wanted to apply cuts to distributions and, and say, okay, um, a focus lies between here and here and there and there and, and uh, because I did some tests and uh, if you do that, you're missing members probably. Also, it's difficult for me, at least for me, it was very difficult to think in five dimensions at the same time. Also, uh, when I started to apply this, I thought about the future potential. Uh, now, I'm, again, I'm not using radial velocities because they are not available there, but as soon as they are, it will be extremely simple for me to include that information, and then I would be able to work in six dimensions at the same time. I don't know if, uh, I should know, but I, I, I don't know now if in the next uh, data release uh, of Gaia, we will have uh, radial velocities for a significant, a significant sample of the objects in here, I don't think so, but maybe for the final ones that will be included. Or also, uh, if we manage to get the uh, many spectra of these targets, then we will get the radial velocities and then we will be able to work on, on six dimensions. So in short, machine learning helped me the most to, say, to go from this step and say, I've, yeah, what boundaries do I choose to just go automatize the thing and, and uh, find over densities on that. <laughs> that is where, where it helped me the most. Uh, more or less clear or? Yeah. I don't. Ah, that's what you mean. That's what you mean. Yeah, yeah now I see. That's what you mean. Uh, I don't know. I didn't do the exercise uh, for that. Yeah, you, you mean to looking in the entire region. But also it's something that I, uh, I have in mind in another project, but for WISE, uh, in line with, with, with your questions. And the problem is that I wouldn't trust at first sight the photometry from WISE. My experience so far is that you have to look at the images. And to look at uh, 2,000 images, it can be painful. Uh, but there are, for instance, neural networks, convolutional neural networks, which in print, I haven't used them yet. But uh, you can use them to 
classify, to discriminate between point sources and background emissions, for instance. So to do that exercise, again, you should look carefully to the background emission, remove contaminants that, again, my impression is that you can have up to 20% of contamination. That's a high number. And once you have a clean sample, you can start looking at the color, color, and, uh, and so on. So, Definitely. Definitely, yeah. Uh, did you find some kind of a, uh, near infrared access for some objects in the in the case, for example, for the KX or any other filter? A couple of them show access uh, in two months, and then you can trust them more. Uh, this one has an access, clear to me, for instance, and this one probably also has an access, and this one, of course, there is a lot of extinction, and ext if you have a lot of extinction still in the infrared, you can have, that's something also to... That's one of the problems, because it's not only that you have a very high amount of extinction, but you have a variable extinction across the field in many cases. So many of these stars has different extinction because in the final color magnitude diagram that you already shown, uh, do you use the uh, same extinction correction for all the star in the color ma no, no. In, the, in the color magnitude diagram, in the two, two before, right? This one. I didn't have correction. No. This, is, this is a pure vector. So you have an idea more or less. So in this magnitude, it's uh, all right. It's not corrected by extinction. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was very careful. I say we don't know, and I prefer to not assume anything. <coughs> Still, even though so, is consistent with belong, belonging to a young population of stars, and the, the, what we find is consistent with uh, in, age, in terms of age, with belonging to a fucus. Star already you find as uh, you know and star forming members according to your criteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, in this kind of greenish thing is my common sample, and in control, uh, sorry, in the magenta are the control sample members that do not belong to my common sample. The 15 percent that weren't uh, discovered by our algorithms. All the all the rest. I mean, there are many control sample members here. 85% of the control sample is within these greenish points, but I didn't, otherwise the plot became too complicated. I think we should stop here. Uh, he will be here at the IAA until tomorrow afternoon, evening. So if you want to talk with him, it's around here. Thank you very much again.